Thank you, Bryson. We do put our hope in His holy word and our living hope, Jesus. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. Good to see you today. Because we put our hope in the right places, I've got some numbers to share with you today. 2, 20, 110. I'll start off with the two. Uh, two young ladies baptized at the Rogers State campus this past week. Go ahead and bring up those pictures of Caitlin Pope. Excuse me, Caitlin and then one young man, Seth Surratt. And so we are thrilled. Give these guys a hand. We are thrilled with what God is doing. They will most likely be over at Brookside this morning. So two new souls in Jesus Christ. At the beginning of our 11 o'clock assembly today, we're going to have another baptism. Jamie Simmons has been sharing the gospel in a powerful way. We're excited about that. Uh, the number 20 and the number 100 correspond with each other. It has been 20 years since the Creek County Jail has allowed a baptism to transpire there behind the bars. Now we witness and hear about baptisms all the time happening through our prison ministry here in other prison facilities, but never at the Creek County Jail until last week. Now this sounds like a preacher number, but it's not a preacher number. We didn't have 101 baptisms. We didn't have 99 baptisms. We had 100 on-the-dot baptisms at the Creek County Jail. And so praise God for that. <laughs> Excited. Excited about what God, our living hope, is doing. And so 2 and 20 and 100, the number 10. 10 a.m. next Sunday, you show up here at Central, you're going to be in an empty parking lot. We love to come together as a family and worship together as a family. We can't do that. We don't own a room like that here. We can't bring in the deaf ministry and Iglesia de Cristo and the 11 o'clock and Brookside and Jinx. But next week we will. 10 a.m., Broken Era Performing Arts Center. Get a map. Check the website. That's where we'll be next Sunday. And you say, what about the visitors that show up here? We're going to have a team of people here. They're going to have quick trip cards. I mean, we want to go out all the way and say, we're so sorry, you've come to the wrong place. We, we tried to get the word out. Here's a gas card. I don't want any of y'all coming here for those free gas cards, okay? <laughs> those are for our guests who have come to the wrong place, all right? I, right now you're going, it's going to be free time. No, don't you do it, all right? But we're doing all we can for even those, as much as we get the message out, they're like, wow, you know, what a blessing. They've, they've thought about everything. I've unfortunately got some other numbers to share with you. These are not good numbers. Go ahead and bring up the next slide. Our church staff took on the youth group in football. <laughs> let, let me just say, that says it all. Uh, we went down big, church, if you weren't there. And let me tell you that the church staff does not appreciate the talents that reside here on stage right now, okay? I didn't see that much playing time. Actually, praise God for that. I'm walking today and all is well. We had a great, great time of food and fun and fellowship. It was a blast. If you've got your Bibles today, turn to the book of Ephesians. Last week, we began a two-part lesson in our month-long series... On family life, we talked about how Ephesians chapter 5, in the first nine verses of Ephesians chapter 6, uh, many theologians call this the household code. Wives and husbands, this is how you honor God. Kids and parents, this is how you honor God. Masters and slaves, uh, modern day thought process in your economic uh, Comings and goings as a family. This is how you honor God. Um, and as we looked at that, we noted that in verse 10 of chapter 6 in Ephesians, Paul takes a strange turn. Husbands and wives, kids and parents, very normal things. And then in verse 10, supernatural, principalities, uh, demons, our enemy, Follow God because this is a spiritual battle. And many people make a huge mistake in disconnecting those two things. The Word of God isn't disconnected. The Word of God flows together. And what the Apostle Paul is telling the Ephesian church and what the Holy Spirit is telling the church today through His Word, as we put our hope in His Word, as we sung about that moments ago, 
is that wives and husbands, kids and parents, the way we conduct ourselves as families has a great deal in everything to do with how we wage war spiritually, how we follow after a living God who is leading us. And so we're in this two-part series called Supernatural 4G Families. Last week we talked about that first G. The Word of God calls us to stand our ground. It's not the devil's ground. The Ephesian church, Paul said, stand your ground. God has given you this. Resist the devil and he's going to do the fleeing. And so we stand our ground. Number two, we talked about we struggle as a group. The Ephesian church wasn't called to be disconnected. Good luck with your family over there. My family's doing fine. Good luck with your individual faith walk over there. My individual faith walk couldn't be better. That's not how we're supposed to operate. We struggle as a group. And as we complete this lesson on supernatural 4G families, we've got two more G's to unpack. And Steve, one of our shepherds, led us in the reading of God's Word. But let's go through this entire thing. Read with me in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Finally, it's been talking about moms and dads, kids, parents, all of these things. Finally, now that I've said all this, be strong in the Lord. Don't stand your ground in your own power. Be strong in Him and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Love that. With this in mind, be alert. And always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Our next point this morning, if you've got a handout on the back of that's a sermon outline. And point number three is this. After you stand your ground, after we struggle as a group, we're called to be a people who stay on guard. With the exception of the sword of the Spirit, Every other element that's talked about here is defensive in nature. It's a guard. Put on a helmet. Put on a breastplate. He he could have said, take catapults with you. Take this or that. No, put on these things other than the sword that protect you. Take a shield with you. And these things don't have so much to do with defensiveness in nature, but they have to do, the word boots, and that metaphor gets it, all these things do with being, have to do with being alert, being ready, the boots of readiness. Have your helmet on. Have your breastplate on. Have that shield ready to go. Have on those boots of readiness. Staying on guard is not, ho-hum, I'm in the back quarter, I'll just stay on guard. Staying on guard has to do with being someone who is ready to move. When the Spirit calls you, see, Paul, I'm going to open my mouth And I need you, church, to pray that when I open my mouth, God is also ready and has words for me to fearlessly go. But Paul's not in the back going, "Uh, you give me the word and then I'll kind of ante forward and I'll say something. Paul's on the front lines, fearlessly once, fearlessly twice. And I'm going to go ahead and open my mouth as I should, and you pray all the time that words would be given. Staying on guard is staying on guard. But it's not in the back part of the troop, you know. It's up 
front, ready to roll. Jesus taught parables on tenants who are ready for their master's return. It wasn't a good thing to be a tenant who went, oh, lo and behold, he's actually coming back today. I've been kind of kicked back and laid back. Blessed is the steward. Blessed is the tenant who is ready. Blessed is the wedding guest to the wedding banquet who hears the call and is dressed and ready. Not enough just to be ready. you got to be dressed and ready. Blessed are those ten virgins. Jesus begins to talk about those who are ready, who wait for that bridegroom to come, and they hear that voice. We need to be a people like Isaiah in 62 who are watchmen, who are ready for battle. We stay on guard. Ephesians 5 and 14. Paul in this family conversation says this about moms and dads, kids and parents. Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. You know, a lot of people as Christians like to talk about doing the most with their money, doing the most with their job, doing the most with this or that, and that's important. But one of the things we really need to let God do the most with is that most precious commodity we have is time. And we make the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil... Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 20. Old Testament chimes in this same spirit of being on guard, being ready. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. Stay on guard, for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Boy, I love this. This speaks to our culture today. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take, only, and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right. Don't swerve to the left. Keep your foot from evil. There are some very practical ways that I could preach today. I'm going to choose one specific aspect of what it is to stay on guard. One of the ways that we stay off guard is being consumed by media. Today, it's been told that the average American spends seven and a half hours, not a week, a day consuming media. This is really no different than 10 or 20 years ago, except for the fact that 10 or 20 years ago we used to look at a big screen, and now we still consume a lot of media, but we look at that small screen. But now it's even more invasive, it's more personal of how it comes into our daily lives. The city of London, England has done something that just baffles me. They've had so many incidents of people doing, you've heard about distracted driving. Well, their big problem in London is distracted walking and people hurting themselves by walking into street signs. They've actually begun to pad pretty good sized pads around their street signs. I'm kind of old school. Let them hit it and they'll learn, you know. But there's not much grace there, all right? They're more gracious than me. And so we've got to pad the street signs. I think Paul would say, don't swerve to the right, don't swerve to the left. Keep your eyes directly in front of you. And you go, so Mitch, you're talking about the physical way we walk. I think this is a symptom of also what we're doing spiritually and emotionally and relationally. We're getting distracted by all of the things around us that take our gaze off of our individual faith walks and off of our family. came across this the other day. It's titled, How to Miss a Childhood. Number one, keep your phone turned on at all times of the day. Allow the rings, beeps, and buzzes to interrupt your child mid-sentence every time. Always let the caller take priority over your child. 
Number two, carry your phone around so much that when you happen to leave it in one room, your child will come running in, come running in with it proudly in hand, treating it more like a much-needing breathing apparatus for you than a communication device. Decide the app you're playing is more important than throwing the ball in the yard with your son or daughter. Even better, yell at them to leave you alone while you play your game. It goes on and on. Don't look up from your phone when your child speaks to you and just reply with an uh-huh so she or he thinks you're listening. Use drive time to call other people regardless of the fact you could be talking to your kids about their day or about their worries, their fears, or their dreams. Read email and text messages at stoplights. Then tell yourself that when your kids are old enough to drive, they won't remember how you drove. Have the phone to your ear when she or he gets in or out of the car. Convince yourself a loving hello or a loving goodbye is highly overrated in the first place. Let us be people who stay on guard. Let us be people that as I'm talking about tech here today, some very, I don't mean to meddle with you. What I, well, I do mean to meddle with you. But what I want to do is encourage you this morning to put some guardrails in your life that bring freedom, that bring safety to your family. Number one thing I want to say this morning is check the tech. Moms and dads, I'm not going to be popular with a lot of our young people this morning, but let me go ahead and say it. You've got to be one that is a guard in your life, as staying on guard in your life, as Ephesians 6 calls us to do it, to stand guard. You've got to check the tech. Parents, your children's smartphones do not belong to them. Go ahead and let them know that right up front. And you have every right at any moment to take that and check the history and see where your kids have been. This won't be the most fun undertaking as you go about it in a moment. But it brings freedom and safety and eternal life to our children. And let me go ahead and say this. While our kids are hearing us, you know, as parents say, yes, moms and dads, our phones don't belong to us either. We're all stewards. We're all tenants. And our spouses, our friends, in fact, you say, I don't have a spouse at this time, then your friends, someone should be checking that. Someone should be an accountability partner in your life. We don't own these devices. We need to be people who check the tech. Someone says, Mitch, I don't like this talk. Um, Let me say this. As our world changes, our parenting styles have to change. Someone says, no, 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 as parents, we never change. Sure we do. No one in the 1800s ever taught their child how to navigate driver's ed. It wasn't needed. My grandparents didn't, you know, teach my parents how to navigate or surf the web. But today, you better believe in the Wilburn household, we're navigating that. We're someone who is in the middle of that. And so number one, guardrail, we check the tech. Number two... In our families, we have tech-free zones. We have rules that say there's no tech in the bedrooms. That smartphone, that internet is not going in that bedroom behind closed doors with you. There's no tech at the dinner tables. I'm throwing you out examples from the Wilburn family. At dinner table, whether it's at a restaurant or in the backyard at a picnic or at our dinner table, that's a tech-free zone. Cell phones have a bedtime. They get tired and they don't need to be recharged. And whether it's 5 p.m. or 6 p.m., they hit a counter downstairs and they're done for the night. There's a psychological disorder known as FOMO, FOMO. In the past, only five-year-olds have had it. This is the process of when the entire family is together hooting and hollering and having the times of their life, but it's bedtime, and you tell that five-year-old, time to go to bed. And they freak out. That's FOMO, fear of missing out. And it used to just be for five- to eight-year-olds, but now it's for 45- to 48-year-olds because the first thing we do when we wake up, FOMO. Where where have they been? And we're checking things. We're about the business of understanding this morning that we have tech-free zones. 75 to 80% of adults, the first thing they do when they wake up in the morning is check their Facebook, check their Instagram. The preacher Henry Beecher said this, the first hour of your day, he got this from Jesus, always in the morning going off to pray by himself, the first hour of your day is the rudder of your day. 
I don't need to be in that 80% where the first thing I check is what my knucklehead friend is doing, all right? What I need to do is check this text. I've got a different text I check. First thing I do when I wake up in the morning. Brothers and sisters, you better know, let me go ahead and say this, I'm preaching to myself this morning. And that's why we put our hope in a living word and a living God who calls us back into good ways of living. And so today we're people who put up a guardrail against those things. Psalm 46 and 10 says this, Be still and know that I am God. And we do that in the mornings. We wake up and we consult Him first. It's not enough, though, to just stay on guard. Ephesians 6 and 10 through 20 in the entire Bible says it's more about not just being ready. There's a time when that call comes where you are ready. And so our next point is this. As a family, as individuals, we strive to a goal. It's good to be ready. It's good to be on guard. It's good to have tech-free zones. And that way we are open to hearing the Word of God when He calls us into action. But the main thing is, is one reason I stay on guard is so that when the Lord calls and with my family, I can strive to that ultimate goal, which is God. It brings purpose to our families. It brings focus to our lives. Isaiah 32 and 8 says this, But the noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. We're called to be different from this world. We're not just getting swept along in the river of mediocrity or of media. We are people who are going upstream, and we are following our God, and we are striving to a goal. Nick Walinda, generational gymnast, circus performer from the flying Walinda family. Nick Walinda now makes a life's work out of taking a piece of rope and stretching it across some place where it should never be stretched and then walking across it. Have you seen this where he, uh, a couple years ago he goes across Niagara Falls, recently across the Grand Canyon. When he was doing Niagara Falls, he goes across once, Eyes open. Comes back the second time, blindfold over his eyes the entire way. He gets on the other side. One thing you need to know about Nick Walinda is he's not just a Christian by name, but he is someone who lives out the Christian walk in a very powerful and overt and light-filled way. And the ABC reporter, as they've done this entire build-up and the walk there and back, they go up to Nick Walinda and they go, tell us what you were thinking. And for the next five minutes, all he does is talk about Jesus. You would have have thought that he hadn't just walked across any type of tightrope. He didn't talk about Niagara Falls. He didn't talk about a tightrope. He didn't talk about his family's history. All he did was talk about Jesus. I don't know who was more nervous in that hour, Nick Walinda or ABC. I mean, all he was doing was letting it go for God. This is someone who is striving for a goal. This is someone who is staying focused. This morning I want to give you two ways that as families we strive to a goal. Number one, we strive to a goal at mealtime. That may seem a little odd, but let me share this with you. Deuteronomy 6, you keep these things in mind as you sit down together. As you gather around that mealtime, Jesus with the Pharisees, he would eat with them. Jesus with the tax collectors, he would eat with them. Jesus with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, he would eat with them. Over and over again, he is striving to a goal, and mealtime is a big, important time of Jesus and the family of disciples and the family of followers staying focused on that goal. Bill Glass, prison minister extraordinaire, has written more books on prison ministry than most people will ever know. And he hears the same thing over and over again early in his prison ministry about how parents of current prisoners would speak to their children. And one day he got a hundred men in a room and he said, and they knew he loved them and he knew that they loved him. And so he was able to say, he said, brothers, all these guys followers of Christ now, He said, let me ask this, how many of you did your parents tell you around the dinner table or at some time in your life, you're going to end up in prison, 
You're going to end up in prison if you keep doing that. He said, every last hand went up. Those were affirming words in the wrong direction. We're called to be people that remember Proverbs 12 and 18 says this, Reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. When we come together at a dinner table and we're striving towards a goal, we tell our children, you have what it takes. We tell our daughters, you're worth fighting for. We tell our sons, you are able, you are capable, and God has good plans for you. We are people that understand that coming together at mealtime is an important time of striving to a goal. Those families that have meals together, and it's, it's hard. And as your kids get older, it gets harder. But the facts are this. Families that have a meal together four or five times a week, okay? Four or five times a week, their children, 40% more likely to make A's and B's. Three times less likely to experiment with marijuana. Two times less likely to become an alcoholic. 40% less likely to become obese. Dr. Catherine Snow of Harvard University studied 65 families. Her quote is this, Dinner time is more important to a child's development than playtime, school time, or story time. It is huge. Let us come together in simple ways and return to the Word of God in simple ways as we strive towards that goal. Number two way, I want to go right back to Jesus in Deuteronomy and how we strive towards a goal. Number one, meal time. Number two, travel time. All right? Jesus, as they, I don't know how many times his best, what appears to be his best, most oomph lessons as they were walking along the road as they traveled from Capernaum to Bethsaida, as they went from here to there, you understand that in the, in the going process, there's also a growing process. And it's in that travel time, Deuteronomy 6, as you walk along the road, share these things with your children. Travel time's important. I wonder how many people even recognize what this next slide is. Anybody know what this thing is? This is an ancient, ancient vehicle, okay? How many of you ever had your hands on one of these? Raise your hands, all right? Back in the day, this is something we did where we, we'd load up kids. And as they were headed to church and headed back to their houses, someone was in that travel time sharing with them the, the Word of God. You say, well, it's, we don't have a joy bus anymore. You bet we do. You go count every car in this parking lot. And that's how many joy buses we have. They just look a little different now, and they're easier to maintain, okay? They look like minivans. They look like F-150s. They, uh, they look like that F-250 out there that makes me lust over it every Sunday morning, all right? They look like that, you know, maybe not a Harley. I don't know how your family would do on that. But anyway, they look like ways of conveyance where we come together and we share faith. You can go ahead and take that picture down. That's hard to look at sometimes. <laughs> In the process of going, there's a process of growing. I want to encourage our dads. I want to encourage our young couples. I want to encourage our young professionals. You go, Mitch, I'll remember this one day when I become a parent. I want you to remember it today. You want your class to come together? You schedule some travel time. You need to schedule some time to go with the grounds underneath a bridge and on the way down there talk about what you're going to do and on the way back talk about what you saw. You need to call Lyle Marcellus, dads, and you need to take your sons and say, furniture ministry, not my favorite, but this Saturday, we're moving couches. And as my son's on the other end, and we're going up to that third floor apartment where that young lady has no furniture, you better believe I'm going to put my son on the downhill end and say, come on, son. But I'm also going to say, this is why we do what we do. Why do you think our youth group is so close? And sometimes we go, boy, I wish we had that. They travel together. They get in vans and go to Houston get together. Why do you think this church is so close more than other churches? We go to New Orleans together. We go to Portland together. We go to Africa together. We go to Honduras together. We go to the DR together. And in that traveling time, faith is built. It not only looks like a dedicated mission trip of a mother and daughter to a hospital, it not only looks like a father and son moving furniture, 
I, I see families as they leave our home. And boy, they preach to me and wish I'd done some things different. As so-and-so family gets ready to leave our house, this routine kicks in where the mother and father begin to say to their children, go thank the host, go thank the Wilburns. Now you go help clean up. You go shake Mr. Wilburn's hand. Don't you call him Mitch. He's going to tell you to call him Mitch. You look him in the eye and you call him Mr. Wilburn. And I'm going through these things and I'm remembering how my father raised me. And in that travel time, these parents of this five minutes of exiting our home, what are they teaching? Teaching respect. They're teaching how to be respectful. The younger ones are watching the older ones. And you better believe the guy who's getting preached to the most is your preacher going, wow, this is what it's all about. Grandparents, don't let the parents have all the fun. You jump in there and have your own joy bus. Get those grandkids. And let me say this. Let me say this. The Word of God calls us to be fathers to the fatherless. It is not just about taking care of our own families. In fact, the New Testament would speak against that. Even the pagans do that. Even the pagans take care of their own. What we're called to do is step outside bounds. And I pray those joy buses out in our parking lot next week, you'd be processing with your kids. Hey, we got an extra seat. How do we fill that next week? We got an extra row in the back. How do we fill that next week? How do we invite people? How do we share faith? One thing I caught on to not too long ago, this story was given to me. I wasn't smart enough to think of this on my own. And so I took him up at his illustration. When we sent Jake and Ashton off to college two years ago and one year ago, I get their little insurance thing that sits in their glove compartment. Moms, dads, kids aren't driving yet, put this one down. In that insurance is a little note that they still haven't seen. I don't believe they've seen it, or at least I don't know about it. That note says, Jake Ashton, if you're finding this insurance in your glove compartment, most likely something has gone wrong. Know this. I love you more than a car. I love you more than any bumper. I love you more than any scratch on the hood, and I pray you're okay. And if you're finding this, when you're not driving, you need to call me. That's a travel time example of how even when our kids go away, we're still blessing them in travel time. P.S. Jake, if the officer is still at the window and no wreck has happened, but yet you have been going too fast, don't feel too bad that DNA comes from your mother. <laughs> She'll be in our 11 o'clock assembly and I won't use that there, but anyway... Slow down and it'll be okay. Just take that same spirit of a loving father. Insurance papers. And not once, but a thousand times in here, he is put in numerous different ways. When you get dinged up, when you get dented up, you better know, son and daughter, that I love you. How much do you mean to me? Turn to the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and drink deep the story of Calvary. That's how much you mean. This lesson isn't just about sons and daughters. It's about every son and daughter of the king in this room. Stay on guard. Strive to a goal of a goal God has called you to, and that is a deep relationship with him. And you can be like the 102 and the one that's going to come at 11 o'clock today and say, that's a father I want to know. And I have been one that has been fatherless, but that can change today because the father of all fathers wants to be your father. Today you can come, we can begin to talk about, we can begin to pray about, we can begin to wrestle with, we can begin to question, or today you can just come and surrender and say, I want to give my life to him in baptism. I want to be a part of a family. That's a big part of staying on guard. And I want to strive to a goal with my family. 
Today I want to come and repent, and as a dad and as a mom, I want to try again. Tonight, Mitch, I'm going to respond. When I go to my kids and say, there's a new sheriff in town, hand me your cell phones. And they all go, ah. Oh. And we're going to play Monopoly together, you know. And we're going to actually talk and interact. And we're going to have a meal together, and we're going to travel together. Mitch, that's how our family's going to respond, and I pray you do that. If we can pray for you in any way today, would you come now as we stand and as we sing? Everyone.